You're listening to the Battle Ready Podcast. My name is Aaron McManus, and I'm here with my dad, Erwin Raphael McManus. It's good to have you today. It's good to be here today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. This week has, it's been two weeks in a row. What has been two weeks? Oh, well, there have been some been busy. It's been hard. It's been fun. But we're launching so many new projects, and we have so much behind-the-scene work that will be revealed soon. Yes. Is it okay to say I'm tired? I'm I think tired. it is. Yeah, of course yeah. it is. I'm yeah. exhausted. Yeah, why do you think being tired is a sign of weakness? Because you made that so growing <laughs> up. <laughs> you you see, super still, clear. they still blame their parents. Don't show, <laughs> I'm, not bl- I'm not blaming you, but you are responsible. <laughs> well, and... Uh, um, well, it's, I think it's good to be tired. There's something about a good tired. When you work really hard, you feel like you've accomplished a lot, and you, it, then you have to give yourself permission to rest. Right. Yeah, in my world, it doesn't, I, don't, I, could, I could give myself the permission to rest, but then you have to give it to me too. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask, hey, can I, can I go away or can I take some time? And I basically say you can take all the time, time off you want in the world. You just have to get these things done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so today we wanted to talk a little bit about a few things that have been going on in our lives. But if you're, if you're just listening to this for the first time, or maybe you're new to the pod, or maybe you've been with us for the last few years, we... We, uh, we're we doing a couple new things. Can we talk about them real quick before we get into the episode? We can talk about everything. Talk about everything. Everything, yeah. Okay, you have a new book coming out September 14th. I do. It's called The Genius of Jesus. It launches September 14th, and you can pre-order it right now. Can you give us the subtitle? The Man Who Changed Everything. It's so good. It's uh, so good. Now, my original subtitle was How to uh, Think, Live, and Create Like the Greatest Mind Who Ever Lived, but it was too long. Way too long. And, Way and, too long. And, and, and the cover felt to me too much like self-development. And I really wanted to focus on the genius of Jesus as, a, as my principal narrative in the book. But what's really cool, though, is because there's a self-development side to this book project. Because the book isn't just the book. The book is the there's book. There's so much going on, yeah. <laughs> the podcast, everything that's coming out around it. Mm-hmm. And you were doing, we're doing a new podcast. And Absolutely. by by we yeah. I mean you. Well, you're producing it. Well, I'm in this room when we're shooting it, and you're yeah. in your room um, recording it. Mm-hmm. And so you know, it's a different place. I am now like Brooke and Austin, and now Austin's Austin, <laughs> and Brooke's Brooke. So it's we've all shifted. But the podcast is the genius of podcast. Yes, you can go and subscribe to it right now. There's a little mini message from you talking about what the podcast is. Mm-hmm. Your face is on the oh, the, the photo icon. Okay. You haven't seen it. I'm excited. You haven't seen it? Yeah. So Hold can on. I tell who my Talk opening uh, interviews are? Yes. Yes. We, so, we shot the first ones this last Wednesday. Yes, that's right. And so what's, cool. what's exciting to me is that over a lifetime, I've had the great gift of making friends with so many incredible people. And I've pretty much never asked them to do anything. And so I've just been reaching out to friends saying, hey, would you do this podcast? Would you be a part of the Genius Of? And for some of them, it's going to be a podcast, just an interview. And for others, we might do something a little deeper, might even do some kind of documentary style episodes along the way. Yeah, yeah. And so the uh, episode, one is, episode a, one is a new friend named Ed Milet. Ed Milet. I'm and, a big fan of Ed Milet. And he is uh, amazing. In fact, when my wife heard a, a conference uh, last year and Ed Milet was on there, she said, she didn't know him, but she goes, my favorite speaker is this guy, Ed Milet. And I said, honey, I know Ed Milet. We're friends. And she was shocked. And then I had greater value. See, I, <laughs> he's the host of the Max Out podcast. He's a best-selling author. I think he has like 2.2 million followers he's, on Yeah, 2.2 million followers stupid on Instagram. stupid like that. When you told me you were like going to go do this interview with Ed Milet, I was like, who is this guy? I went on a run. I threw on yeah. his podcast. And I think it was with... I listened to two, and I can't remember who the first one was, but it was amazing. Oh, I, listen, the first one was with you that I listened to. <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 but there was another one. Oh, it was the CEO of Netflix that he did a podcast with. Oh, wow. With. So mm-hmm. I, I listened to yours, and then on the way back on the run, I listened to the CEO of Netflix, and mm-hmm. it, oh, it was, like, really amazing. He's You guys have good energy together. Well, he's a great interviewer. A great interviewer. And just a really fascinating person. So I asked him to be on the other side of the table. He yeah. interviewed me, yeah, yeah, and now yeah. I got to interview him. Yeah. And – but – um. My podcast is specifically about extricating the genius out of my guess so that we can begin to see a little bit behind the curtain of genius and then hopefully to help unlock the genius inside of everyone who's listening. And so that's the subtitle for that podcast. The genius of 
unlocking the genius within, within you. Within you, that's right. Which is pretty cool. It is pretty exciting. And 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 my, what? My, my second. Who's uh, your second? Guest? My second guest is Jamie Kern Lima. Yes. Uh, Jamie uh, was uh, a waitress at Denny's. And, no way. And then she um, she started a cosmetic company called It. Sold it to L'Oreal. I think wow. probably a decade later for one point two billion dollars. Yes. And the best part of that interview yeah. was when, well, I did like the prep with her. Like she jumped on and, and she was like, Aaron, my internet just went out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, how are you doing this? She's, you know, she's just using cellular like connection to, right. to connect face to Zoom. And it actually looked amazing. It was really great. So it was really fun. We were texting afterwards. But she talks about the story the, of the day she sold the company because L'Oreal is a public company. Right. They had to do a press release on acquiring it cosmetics. And <laughs> she hadn't told her mom that she was selling it for $1.3 billion. So her mom calls her like, I guess you're a billionaire now. And she's like, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> and, <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to be public. And, and it's they're both great stories and great people. And then I already have confirmation that my next guest is going to be Angela Davis. Yes. And I'm so excited about Angela, who was an Olympic sprinter, who uh, became famous through SoulCycle, who was on Amy Schumer's uh, movie, um, I Feel Pretty. And, she was. And she just is, did a thing with James Corden and David Beckham. And she's on, the like, founder of Army, and, yes. which is a personal development fitness uh, yeah. company. And I remember when you met Angela Davis. M Angela Manuel Davis is, I mean, she's among many things. Yes. She has like an incredible sister named Natalie, yeah. an incredible brother named Jerry Lorenzo, uh, incredible husband named Jerome Davis. Mm -hmm. And their their story, at some point we got to bring Jerome on because- I know, the their story together is so amazing. The story so of how they met is yeah. insane, yeah. insane. But also Angela, the first time I met her was at Mosaic with you and you were telling me about her and I was in Venice and so one of the day, Sundays you were like, hey, once you're done with Venice, just drive over to Hollywood mm -hmm. and come hang out and meet meet my new friends. And she she was an instructor at Soul Cycle. She was like the instructor at Soul Cycle mm -hmm. in 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 LA and yeah. kind of the world. But you were like, hey, I'm not going to do Soul Cycle, so you're going to go do Soul Cycle and go hang out <laughs> with Angela and Jerome. And I remember going to Soul Cycle and just getting absolutely rocked, like wanting to throw up mid class. And her class was really special because it's all these like Beverly Hills moms. But well, then not all, just Beverly. I mean, yeah, I, I, like, I went twice. No, no. You you did not go twice. I did go twice. When? I I, I you went got twice. on a bike. You I put did. the shoes on. I did. They put a bike right by the door for me, so that can if I need to go outside, this? Can, we, I can just, we look at his financials <laughs> and see if he ever actually? <laughs> <laughs> and and I think I can say like Tyler Perry was there. I think like oh, Tyler Perry, Jay Z, Beyonce, Beyonce <laughs> David Beckham, <laughs> Olivia Wilde, uh, uh, like some low key like huge producers that are in. I remember sitting outside with Angela afterwards, like drinking a smoothie, just like. Cause that was the best part. She was like so social. Was, like, so she's community. like a trainer of all the all the A list celebrities yeah. in yeah. LA. And who actually care about their physical health. Who actually care. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty surreal, right? Like being in a room. And she's yelling at all of them. Yelling. She treated no one equal. If anything, she was way meaner than, to Jay Z than to anyone else. <laughs> being like, Jay. Go harder! I'm <laughs> yelling back. I'm going as hard as I can. But I do think it's funny. They actually put a bike for me by the door. By the door. They, oh, I do remember. <laughs> they were worried that I would black out. <laughs> the, the, it is kind of a blackout class. I remember the first time I, I, I went and, and you know, like the, the really like good athletes – sit like right in front of the instructor so sure. middle center so like your value in the class of like your athleticism mm -hmm. is how close to the center you are because it, it's really interesting like it's so organic because you're always looking to the person in front of you and to the person closest to the instructor sure. to, and that's why i was in follow. the back to the far left yeah <laughs> so when i first went she put me in the back left and i'm sitting next to this i'm on the bike next to this like 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 mom housewife mm -hmm. woman and She's, I'm, she's like, is this your first time? I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of nervous. She's like, oh yeah, like I mean, I do this like three times a week, and I'm like super hungover. So like, you'll be fine. And I'm, and she rocked me the whole class. <laughs> I'm like, you have three kids and you're hungover, and I am dying in here, and you are, and you're just thriving, living your best life. <laughs> Anyways, I, she brings the best energy. So she's gonna be one of my guests. She is. <laughs> and I have others like Jim Quick, who's a brain specialist, wrote a book called Limitless. Uh, I have my friend Lewis Howes, who's agreed to come on. Who Lewis How? Who has How? This. No S. How? House. House? Yeah, with the S. Like a house. Yes. House. You're correcting me. I had to say my friend's name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
I have my friend Lewis House coming on, <laughs> and uh, who uh, has a school of greatness. A um, podcast called The School of Greatness. I have uh, Rebecca Zoom coming on, who's an expert, an attorney expert uh, negotiator with narcissists. Oh, and um, and can I? I should say share. No, no. I'm we have keep, someone. I'm gonna keep one. We have a big fish. These are all big fish, but we yeah. have a big. We have a whale. <laughs> we have a whale. <laughs> and uh, we, we do. We do. Mm-hmm. And I'm Jonah. <laughs> or um, the whale hunter, Moby Dick. That's it. No, wait a minute. What was his name? Captain Ahab? Yeah, Ahab. Captain Ahab. Yeah, but that story yeah. doesn't go well for Ahab. That's true. So That's let's, true. Not, <laughs> let, let's not use that analogy. Jim Quick is really interesting because he's a yeah. brain coach, New York Times bestseller of Limitless, has a podcast, Quick Brain. But you met him at a, an event in Miami a few weeks ago yeah. or a month and a half ago, and you've become friends. So I'm really excited about some of these people. We're also trying yeah. to get a couple of young musicians on that are some friends and a couple maybe pro surfers. So we'll see how this goes. I'm really excited. Be fun. And, and the fun part for me is that I get to take an hour and kind of pull out the genius inside of these individuals, talk about how they developed that genius, how they developed that uniqueness. And, you know, whenever you you – talk to someone who does something almost intuitively, they're not oftentimes even aware of how they um, achieve that greatness. You have to ask them questions to bring clarity to their process. And then once you see the process, you you, you can't steal their genius, but you can steal their process. Yeah, yeah. And then begin to develop your own genius, your own gifting and talent, which so is exciting. This new podcast, it's it really is more of a step publicly in your like in like the business space. And like the, 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 not self-help, but personal growth, business, science, kind of, because everything really you've done, like publicly has been faith-based, spiritual journey. So many of my public, yes, conversations are about uh, faith, about Jesus, about the scriptures. And, yeah. But it's not the way that I live my life. What like, do you mean? I live my life in every world. Every world, right. You, you know, yeah. and I mean, I've spent my life... Uh, studying every discipline I can get my hands on. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not like a lot of people would say, oh, if you're a Christian, all you need is the Bible. But, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that was also reading Scientific American and, you know, and, yeah, and the Atlantic, a reader like, in the Atlantic yeah. and, you know. Um, going to TED the, the last 12 and, years. And, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I've, oh, actually, I've been going to TED for 20 years. And Has it been 20? Yeah. It's been Good a long Lord. time. And because uh, I went to the 20 year anniversary and there was a Tanzania. So I know. Oh, geez. Yeah. And so I was there both <laughs> times. Funny story. The first one and the last one. And wait. So you. Oh, that was the one you went back to. Yeah. So wait, the, because the first time you went out, I remember we were flying to South Africa. I was yeah. I was a little kid. And at the end of the trip, you were flying to Ted. That's no right. one really knew what Ted was back then. No, that was before it was super, it was super, super before well Before the app, before like the videos before were online. The, yeah. Before the talks were made public. Right. Yeah. And so you were like, OK, I'm leaving. And we had made friends with this like young fashion, like not young. He was. I think he was a bit older than you at the time, like fashion designer. He was like the brother of one of the pastors that we were there with. I think, wasn't it the fashion designer guy? Because remember you lost your suitcase? They lost your suitcase. Oh, I met, that's right. I made friends with that guy in South Africa. And so they yeah. lost your suitcase in your connecting flight. So he flew up and gave you clothes? He actually, in Cape, T- no, in um, Johannesburg, passed me some clothes through security so that I could take it with me to Tanzania. Okay. But the problem, of course, is that he was a fashion designer and he had a very particular taste. I mean, it was so loud and flamboyant. And it was uh, like saran wrap. It, it, it's, it, it's, it wrapped me as if I had a washboard stomach. And yeah. And so I couldn't wear any of it. So I had to wear the same clothes for a week. At yeah, wearing like, I had... like loud pink, blue, <laughs> the whole thing. It was, it, yeah, it was an incredible can... uh, journey in, in humiliation. <laughs> and, but it, it, I remember. <laughs> anyway, and then going back 20 years. So wh- where are we going with the TED story? I have no, I don't even remember. We were just talking about the different people that we have coming on. And how, no, no, with, with TED you're asking. Um, I, I've been informed by so many disciplines different all space. my life. Yes. But I've never actually translated that into something like a podcast or something into a public conversation. Right. So now I get to talk about every subject I'm interested in with people I'm really interested in. Yes. Which and, is really cool. And, and not necessarily faith-based, no, because but spiritual. I, because I, well, it's not even, I think everything is spiritual. So, you know, that's a part of my frame Talk of about life, that, right? Because I think a lot of Christians have a hard time when you as a pastor spread your wing. But they don't realize the wings have already been spread. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's. They're just becoming aware of it. That's just because that's that's the way that they have to 
structure the, the, their understanding of reality. Right. You, you know, I've never only been a pastor. You know, I've, I'm a human being and I'm yeah. an artist. And I'm creative. I'm a yeah. futurist. I'm an entrepreneur. And, yeah. and uh, you know, and people have to put you somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Right. You, you yeah. know, and but I think that what's important to me is. One, I think Christianity has incredibly thin thinking, and a lot of it is because it, uh, we, we haven't really taken time to be thoughtful and to, and to explore things deeply. And, and uh, you know, I, I mean, we can learn as much from biology and from botany and from, um, you know, astronomy and from the different sciences. I mean, physics can give us incredible insights to our own spiritual journey. And I think sometimes we underestimate how much insight, not just how much truth, but how much mm. insight is in nature, is in creation, it's in the universe, it's in yeah. all the sciences. And I've, I've always been intrigued by that. Mm. And that's part of what shapes my thinking. Mm. And so what's interesting to me is that on Sunday, people want me just to talk about the Bible, but everything I talk about out of the Bible is informed by everything I'm studying all the time. Yes, I think it's wonderful, and I'm really excited. And when we came up with this this project idea together, I mean, you had come up with a book, and then it yeah. was just, it was so quick after that. It was like, it made yeah. so much sense. Now I feel like I wish we had been working on this for the last year, which we have, but mm -hmm. now it's all culminating, and the, 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 everything's lining up, and we're doing interviews, and we're getting people, and we're on the phone, and I'm like, if anybody knows any, anybody who might be a genius, I'm like, let's, <laughs> let's have a conversation. So anyways, th this is this is my half of the table. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, that our legs were kicking each other. So we just announced my new book, The Genius of Jesus. It comes out September 14th. We've announced the new podcast, The Genius of, yes. and with my first guest, uh, Ed Milet. And, yes. um, and, and Jamie Lima. And Jamie Lima the next week. And it's going to just dominate with great, great people. I'm so excited. And uh, And we have so much more. That's happening. We, so much we're fun. working on um, uh, a platform where y you can get deeper, more intense teaching, mentoring. And I have so many people who DM me that I cannot get back to and who send me uh, requests saying, um, would you give me an hour of your time? Or someone saying, would you? Oh, I, <laughs> one guy kept asking me, I'll pay you for 20 minutes of your time. And, and I feel so badly because they don't realize how many people are asking the same thing. And it would just absolutely consume every moment I have. And, you know, people ask me, can you teach us how to communicate? Or can you teach us how to lead? Or can you teach us how to think? Or can you mentor me in my business? Or can you mentor me in, you know, uh, this particular phase of my life journey? And, and so one of the best ways I can try to solve that problem is by creating content where I can pass on to people what I would pass on to them if I was sitting one-on-one, -on -one. if I was sitting with you having coffee, if I were trying to teach you how to become a better communicator, if I was trying to teach you how to be a better leader or a better thinker or a better writer. And so we're going to, we're creating uh, extensive content that people can actually access and um, to help them in, uh, in their personal growth. And I think it's it's really cool. Like the, the, we're working on some subscription-based stuff yeah. where it's like $9.99 a month mm -hmm. to, to access basically all the archives of what mm -hmm. you've done over the last like 40, 30 years, which is really cool. <laughs> so there's like some old mullet Erwin McManus on there and, some, right. and some new, like all the, throughout the years. And then also like bring kind of some mosaic Bible college into that app as well. Mm. And then we've got stuff that's like master class on communication that's going to be like much more expensive, you know, like yeah. – you know, like higher level business kind of level, like thousand dollars for 10 hours of mm -hmm. going deep into practical steps on how to like be a better communicator, better leader and a better creative. Yeah. And I think it's interesting when uh, you're looking at things where you're charging because uh, pretty much everything I've ever done, I've done for free. Right. And right, people right. are used to getting everything from me for free. Right. And then the moment you charge for people. Wait a minute, why are you charging for that? Yeah. And when yeah. I was at this event where people paid a hundred thousand dollars a person to be there, I asked one of the guys, um, I did not pay that amount. I was the speaker, but um, I said, why would you pay so much money to be here? And he said, one thing I've learned in my business is if you don't pay, you don't pay attention. Mm. And he said, one of the ways that you know you pay attention is when you pay for the value of something, no one has to convince you to show up. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. no, one, no one has to tell you to show up, or, show up early and stay late. No one has to tell you not to miss a session. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. when yeah. you've paid this so, kind so of true. money for something, yeah. you're going to extricate everything you can and get all the value out of it you can. And, and basically telling me, because you always give everything away, people don't realize the value which you're giving them. Should we dive into our first topic? All right. So let's do it. Um, 
We want to talk about fear. Yeah, I think this is an important conversation um, for a number of reasons. I, um, I just went and got my hair cut and there's all these different studios where I go and okay. where people are getting their hair cut or getting mm -hmm. other things, I guess. It's you know, kind of like a, like a collective office yeah. space that have tons of different like, studios. And so I walked by a door and it said, mass required even if you're fully vaccinated. Okay. And so we're going there. I, I'm going there because I, I, I saw that and thought, oh, wow, here's a person who's genuinely afraid. Like they don't want any, any customer to come inside of their store, even if they're fully vaccinated without a mask. And, and I thought, she's going to go out of business. Yeah. Because once other places don't require a mask and that's already happening. Yeah. And once people are more yeah. open because they're fully vaccinated, whatever it is, um, that requirement will eventually cost your other customers. And I, and I had this thought instantly that the mask cannot protect you from fear. Right. 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 And, and that's why I wanted to start here is that, um, I, saw, I read this article that if you're in a world where everyone is fully vaccinated and you're outdoors and you're still wearing a mask, are you making a rational scientific decision or are you now making a decision based on fear? So much of so many decisions out of the last year have been mm -hmm. based on fear. Absolutely. So many. Right. And and I, I always find it odd. And we've talked about this multiple mm -hmm. times. So I don't want to go too deep into it. Mm -hmm. But I, I always find it odd when it says when people say or a sign says or the CDC or or really it's it's general cultural mm -hmm. population of like mm -hmm. trust the science. Like, well, you can't trust the science because the science is always evolving. So if I trusted at one point A, at mm -hmm. point C, it might be different. Sure. Then it made point A a liar. So mm -hmm. I can't trust science anymore. Well, it is interesting, even recently. To continually yeah. grow with the science, right? right? Dr. Fauci was asked, you know, how do you deal with the fact that you've changed your mind or changed what you've said so many times? He said, people can't be angry with me. They have to be angry at the science. And But what, what he's not really, like, um, grappling with is that it's not that the science keeps changing. It's that our understanding of the science keeps changing. See, it's like the whatever is, it actually is. <laughs> and, uh, Explain that, though. What does that mean? Well, either Pluto is a planet or it's not. We don't. Re does anyone know <laughs> if Pluto is a planet or not? No one in the booth. They're right. saying no one knows. Okay, but Pluto did not change its essence. Our understanding of Pluto changed. And then it changed again. And it changes again. <laughs> right, right. And my, whole, my, my point of that is that... Um, in the same way, he would say, you can't be mad at me because I'm just giving you the science and the science keeps changing. That is actually an acknowledgement that our interpretation of science is subjective, not objective. Interesting. And as we get new data, of course, we're supposed to change our minds and, and change our perspectives. But when we act as if our present perspective is absolute fact and Written truth. stone then we're confusing ourselves with the science. It's the scientific version of the Christian who, when he says God says, it's just them saying it, but they think they're God. Yes. And uh, and the same way I don't trust preachers who always say this is what God says because I'm going, I think you're confusing yourself with God. I had the same concern with scientists who talk about what science says and there's an inseparable relationship between them and science. And it's the same level of narcissism, whether it's religious or scientific, supposedly. And But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is fear. Because uh, so last night after we went to an LAFC soccer game, it was a lot of fun. And we're in the parking lot talking. One of my friends um, who is probably like um, a person who ext was extremely fearful of COVID and the virus and, 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 you know, very pro vaccine. And, and at one point he even said, look, you know, we all need to get a vaccine. He goes, cause I, I know that COVID will kill me. And I looked at him and I said, you, you don't know that you, you would probably be fine. He's young, he's healthy. He is. Yeah. And, and, and he just stopped, but he, but in his mind, he knows COVID will kill him. And so the, the vaccine is non-negotiable. And I have another friend he's also really good friends with, and he'll never take the vaccine unless you strap him down, you know, and uh, put him under and give him the, the vaccine while he's unconscious. And they're both Ivy League graduates. You know, <laughs> so they're both super intelligent. Oh, and, I, oh okay. I know what friend yeah, you're talking about. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and what's interesting to me is we don't seem to be able to separate what we think we know with what we feel. Hmm. 
And and I looked at him and I said, hey, I'm fully vaccinated, but not for the same reason as you. Mm. You were afraid and I've never been afraid. And, he, and then he looked at the other guy and he goes, yeah, but he's never afraid of anything. <laughs> so it's not fair to use him as the basis of this. Right. And, and, and I, I want to pull back and go, I, I do experience fear. I do not let fear make my decisions for me. Hmm. And I remembered a TED talk from several years ago in Vancouver. I mean, there's been quite a few talks on fear. I think Tim Ferriss has a really famous talk on fear from Ted. And, uh, but I remember in this Ted talk, uh, the person was talking about, uh, almost like the, in the, uh, evolution of human innovation. And they said that fear was a driving mechanism of human innovation, that every great innovation, every great advancement, hmm. uh, in human history was driven and motivated, fueled by fear. And I could, I could not have disagreed more with a talk in my life because I, I one, I don't think us going to the moon was driven by fear. I think is maybe driven by curiosity or, or many other things. Yeah. I, I actually do not think that even uh, finding the, uh, you know, the, um, the cure for polio was driven by fear as much as it maybe had been driven by, by compassion. And, um, and, and I started thinking about my own life. Like a lot of times what I do is when I have a big concept I have to, I have to grapple with, I, I whittle it down to personal experience in terms of my own journey. Mm -hmm. I think, my worst decisions have been made when I was afraid. <laughs> Interesting. And fear has never actually opened up my imagination. In fact, I think if you look at it neurologically, uh, when you're afraid, your reptilian brain kind of takes over and the part of your brain that actually imagines, creates, innovates, it shuts down. You actually move into a sur survival mode. And so I'm sitting here listening to, and you know, Ted is sort of like, when you're on the platform, you've been given an expertise. You're the expert. Mm. And... And I'm sitting here listening to this person going, you're sitting here telling us that fear is the driving motivator of human history. When on a personal level, I can tell you that fear makes me make my worst decisions. It limits my imagination. It limits my creativity. It limits my innovation. And, it's, and I actually think that love is the greatest driver of innovation, that um, the, the universe around fear cripples us. The universe around love actually uh, inspires us. It, it, it makes us limitless. And... And I started wondering how many of us would agree with the speaker thinking that fear is a driving motivation behind human innovation. That, that, uh, and yet I, I think if we did a survey, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to get at least a, not an 80-20 or a 90-10, but I think we're going to get a 99-1 where you're at your best when you're afraid or you're at your best when you're not paralyzed by fear hmm. and when you're free of fear. Right. And, uh, and, and you and I had this conversation when you were a, a young boy. Yeah. We were, yeah. we were stuck in New York. Yeah. I lost my wallet. And then you lost your wallet. <laughs> yeah. We were in the middle of uh, time, and, uh, the train so set. I think I didn't bring my wallet. No, you left it in the taxi. No, you left it in the taxi. Yours in the taxi. I left my wallet in Westchester. Oh, yeah. In the and suburbs. then yeah, we, yeah. we took a, a subway to New to York the city. city. And then we got in a taxi. And then you left your wallet in the taxi. The taxi took off. We didn't have a phone. Uh, we didn't yeah, have a wallet. And that was bad. That was really bad. <laughs> we're, it's midnight. We have probably an hour walk through Manhattan uh, to get to where we were staying. Yeah. And as we're walking, you started getting a little anxious and a little nervous because it looked a little no, shady in some of no, the sections. No, no. That's no, that's not right. Yes, it was. No, that's not right. I was a full grown adult. I don't think I was. No, nervous. no, you were young. No, I remember how old I was. I was 23 years old, 22 years old. There's no way I was nervous. I was a raging narcissist at 22 years old. I thought I was God. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought nothing could kill me. <laughs> then, well, you had angry. I was anger. I was okay. angry and I was frustrated. And I was more nervous that we were, we had no source of income at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, how are you going to solve this? Yeah. If you're stuck in the middle of a city and you don't know anyone, how do you solve this? And yeah. you were just so angry at yourself and so angry at, you know, everything. And yeah. then I remember I looked at you and I said, Aaron, you got to let the anger go because I need you right now to innovate. Yeah. yeah. I need you right now to, uh, to figure out how to solve this problem. Right. And, and right now, because you're angry, all that's activating is your reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the part of you that just moves into survival mechanism, survival mode. 
and you're not going to be able to think more creatively. And you looked at me and you said, is that a real thing, that reptilian brain thing? <laughs> because I'm going to quote you and I want to make sure I'm actually talking about something that's real. <laughs> and, oh, my gosh. And, and, and my whole point of this is. That sounds like me. That, <laughs> that part very much sounds okay. like me. <laughs> is that fear is not the best human motivator. No. And that now we're living in a, hopefully, a post-quarantine, post-COVID era. But we're not in a post-fear era. If anything, fear is as alive and vibrant and flourishing as it ever has in the world. It's like contagious. It yeah, is, absolutely. It, it is a contagion and it's a virus and it is spreading. And it's now I – was, I was in my coffee shop this morning and I pulled up and I ordered on my app because that's how it's been for the last like, mm -hmm. year. Um, it's a coffee shop by your house and we've been going there for eight years or mm -hmm. something since it's opened up. Seven years since I moved back. So – I go up to it. The door's open. People are allowed inside. Did I tell you? I didn't even told you this yet. I drove by yesterday. I saw people could go inside. Crazy. No, well, it, they didn't do it in the morning. It must have been in – because I went in the morning and mm -hmm. there was no one inside. So it must have been in the afternoon. Yeah. I must have done it. So I go up. I'm like, oh, I could have just ordered at the – they have like a little coffee mm -hmm. bar thing. Could have done that. Go in. I'm like, hey, I didn't know you guys were open. How does it feel? And – this coffee shop started as like the local spot and then now there's like seven of them around the city. Right. So the people, I saw one of the old GMs mm -hmm. who was there, Jamie, and she was like, oh my gosh, hi, how are you? And, but none of the people that work there, I don't know them, they don't know their faces because it's been masks since <laughs> since they've been there, since I, since the, in the last year. So I, I went in and I was, I was talking to the, to the young girl who was, who was serving and I was like, how is it? How is it to be open? And she's like, I don't know. It makes, I'm like, still like, it's very weird. Like, I don't know if, if I, if I'm like ready for this or if I like this. And she was very anxious mm. and very afraid. And she's like, but they've been like training us to like open back up. And I'm like, you know, I, I we didn't have a long conversation. She was very nice about it, but I've had a lot of interactions with them over the last six weeks because, or last like two, three weeks, because as things have opened up more, they've been like holding on to this fear, to this, mm -hmm. to this very much so keeping everything closed. I, they posted on social media when, when, when LA said you can open back up, no masks, indoor, outdoor. They put out a thing. We're going to be a stronghold of people taking care of people and keeping things safe. And Brooke, who's in the booth, her husband went on and commented along. He's like one of the smartest people we, we know. <laughs> went on and commented along. <laughs> Do you not like this story? No, I was just like, babe, maybe not. You but, told him that? Well, you know. We can't, we can't hear you, Brooke. Oh, we're just, it gets tricky commenting on other people's Instagrams, you know. <laughs> We work for Mosaic. We're not trying to speak for Mosaic. <laughs> but then other people from Mosaic jumped on like, thank you. Thank you for speaking no, up. Friends from that neighborhood that like don't go to church were like comment, like like liking the photo. Like, right, they weren't commenting. What did he say for a list? Oh, he went off and just said, you're talking about trusting the science, but how can you trust the science if science says we can open back up now? We're good. The masks aren't the most effective. Coming inside is safe. Coming, Being outside is safe. Like... You say you trust the science, but you only are trusting one version of the science, one release of the science. And so it, it, one of the things is that I don't hate this coffee shop. At first, I was like, we're never going back. I hate them. Except you love the coffee but shop. But I love the coffee shop. <laughs> and I, and I have a, I've had – this is my second cup, and I've had two from them today. I love giving them business. Like they've been friends of mine for the last – seven. she's Brooke's drinking it too. Yeah. Uh, obviously, her husband didn't win her over. But I, I, this is the thing. I had this thought. Mm-hmm. How do we let go of fear? Right. Because I'm I'm in the same place in my own life. We were having this conversation like in dating. I am <laughs> so afraid of dating because it's gone so horribly wrong. Yes. I, I This is not a knock to people I've dated. I am not great in relationships. I'm really insecure. I get really anxious and I get really afraid. And so it makes it really – I think I find lovely people who maybe I should or shouldn't date – but then I make it really awful because I bring all of the, my fears into a relationship. Mm. So how do you let go of fear? And in this moment, like my coffee shop, how do they let go of the version of the truth that was true at a time but not true anymore? Yeah, I think this is uh, interesting in terms of the reality is that people are not the same. People are on the spectrum of fear. Okay. And so some people are more afraid than others. Okay. And some people are more susceptible to fear, I think, than others. And so if you 
have an environment where there's a high susceptibility toward fear, which is what we have right now. It, it, I think it accentuates. It's almost like it pulls, it skews the, um, the sample. And, and so you're not afraid of COVID, but you are afraid of David, d- dating. You, you're, not, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. you're not afraid of COVID, but you are afraid of intimacy. Yeah. Yep. That's another episode <laughs> and, and that so, will never come out. <laughs> so you can look really courageous when it comes to a virus. Yes. But if you move, if we move you into a different environment, which is relationships, then you look more afraid. Right. And I don't so look more afraid. You I'm are just, more afraid. I'm trembling. Yeah. And, and so fear isn't always transferable. That's what I'm saying. It's like it's not always transferable to everything. Some people are more afraid of one thing, but not afraid of something else. So how come courage doesn't cross over? Well, courage does cross over because courage is a choice. It's not, uh, it's not a, um, an attribute. See, we, we try to make courage an attribute, like, oh, that person is courageous. But actually, courage is actually more of a dynamic. You have to make courageous choices. And so you don't know if you're courageous until you make the choice. And it's in those moments where it costs you something. It's in, it's in those moments where you have to choose an easy path or a right path and that you discover the level of your courage. Hmm. And and so we, we try to make it as if there are different essential differences between a person who's afraid and a person who's courageous. And I actually think the difference is character, that the difference is the uh, the choices that you make in those circumstances. So, for instance, um, with dating. Mm-hmm. Um, Low character. <laughs> no, that you have to realize, oh, I have to make choices that – that actually express courage in this relationship because there's no greater risk than love. Like there's, there is no greater risk than intimacy. There's no mm-hmm. greater risk than allowing a relationship to go deeper and deeper because um, all your fears are true. The more you open yourself up to someone, the more risk you have of being hurt. Yeah. And, and so, to- so no, thank you. <laughs> I'm good now. And not because no. I, I feel like I have been courageous in the past mm-hmm. and I learned no, but you're learning the wrong lesson. You see no. that? No, that's what, the problem. Okay, so with tell me the so tell me no, because I think you're saying it's a character thing, but but mm-hmm. Cornell versus Columbia, your two Ivy League friends, yes, both have great character. Yeah, they're great Bo- people. They've both grown from tough situations. I'm sure they both have mm-hmm. made mistakes in their lives. I don't know. Yeah, but you know, one's super open, one's a newer friend. Learning. I wouldn't say either one of them have bad character, but they have two different versions of courage. Yeah, I'm not talking about good character or bad character. Okay, I, I'm I'm talking about a strength of character to make choices based on the person you choose to become. Okay. Um, like, so give me practicals. All right. Yeah, a practical. Um, well, I, I want If you don't like, if you are unable to have intimacy. Well, I, I, I'll start with the simple practical. Okay. Um, some people are afraid to try new I'll foods. I'll determine if it's simple. Okay. You, did, you just give the practice. It's funny. When people ask me, how do I start to become more courageous or how do I start to become more innovative or whatever it may be? Right. I, I kind of always been with food. Interesting. I tell them, I said, look, go to a restaurant of a particular style of food that you would not normally eat. Mm-hmm. Whether it's you know Italian or Chinese or or Thai or whatever it may be or sushi, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and try something you've never tried before. Okay, eat something that you're afraid to try, mm-hmm. because eating is one of the safest places you can actually begin to develop an internal mechanism that allows you to risk. And uh, you know if you've never tried sushi, go try sushi. But I'll eat anything. I'll eat anything. I'm not gonna. <laughs> but I don't want to be in a relationship. But for a lot of people, eating <laughs> food is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but but that's the funny thing. You do want to be in a relationship. Nope. And, I don't want to be you know, not right now. What I I well I'm gonna I'm gonna go from what my perspective on this is that no go, go, go. You, we can air it out a little bit. We can always cut it out if it's no, a little too close that, that usually the very thing we're afraid of is the thing we want most. It's something I've desired so <laughs> bad. No no you know because I was like very depressed yeah. during COVID and I was like like there are moments of like suicide stuff. Not that I tried, but that I was like really, really in a dark, 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 super suicidal place. And I, you're luckily I'm very close with you and I can bring you into moments where I'm really not good. And it was interesting because I, I someone actually hit me up. They posted something that was like, I've been really depressed, X, Y, Z. But it was on like close friends story mm-hmm. on Instagram. So there's like a few people that saw it. I responded immediately like, hey, 
I stayed with them until like three in the morning just texting. Mm -hmm. And it was like, hey, um, you know, I've struggled with these things. You know, if you need anybody just to like talk with, I'm here. And the person was like, hey, we don't even know each other that well. I'm like, that's funny that I'm on your close friends list on Instagram if we don't know each other that well. <laughs> <laughs> but but they really appreciated it. And I and I and they were like, I just feel like I'm draining everybody in my life talking about the stuff I'm down about. Mm. And so I, I was like, look, this is something I've been doing lately is when I have a really good day, when I feel really genuinely happy, I call my dad and tell him, hey, or I text him, hey. Today is like an amazing day and I feel like whether it's the chemicals in my brain or just the positivity around me or maybe I just feel closer to God or people around in my life, um, I feel good today. Mm. So thank you for being with me on all the days I feel bad. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so good. And, and so she, she, uh, she sent a text to her mom being like, hey, like, thanks for, you know, like it was like yeah. a really cool thing. That's so good. And, but, but I would say this, like I've been really down during COVID about relationships. Or like, I, I just feel so alone. I just don't want to, I don't want to be by myself. Mm -hmm. And then I'm now I'm good. I feel happy. I like being, I like being on my own. I like not having to answer to anybody. No, it's not about, uh, so oftentimes fear is rooted in things that you fear to lose. Um, like the, the, you know, the fear of loss or the fear of rejection or, um, and, you know, it, it, when you're having you, a hard time with this, huh? Well, I'm just trying to be super sensitive. <laughs> no, don't be. We always cut it out. We always cut it out. Just don't be sensitive. No, no it's. Why you do you know, think I pendulum sw swing? Oh, well, one is that fear is basically the, no, no. the dark side of faith. Fear is, a, of, okay. a, fear is a negative projection of the future. Negative project. But I'm not saying I'm afraid. I'm saying I don't want it. That's different. You're saying I'm afraid of it. I do think you're afraid of it. Probably a little bit. <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> but but it's easier to say you don't want it. But, what do you mean you say you don't want it? No, no, no. But, but I don't want it and I can have it right now. And it's not – and that's not a knock to anyone. It's how do I – I'm like, you know this because I'm trying to – like – the good people have come in my life and like, how do I switch the feelings now? Because I feel like I've got good on my own. Now I don't know how to be like. Right. Because you're going, wow, I like this space. There's no pain here. There's no pain here. It's only, it's only happiness because it's, everyone's a friend now. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And people are like, you want a date? I'm like, nope. <laughs> I, I just want to be friends. Yeah. But it's because you stop believing there can be more in a healthy and positive way. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So and, how do you? And and some of it is you have to believe that you you can be fully known and fully loved. I am by you and God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I feel satisfied. But it's also the uh, the the, and I say it, the gift of 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 loving someone else, and. Um, but I do love people. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know. Well, I think I was just so focused on trying to date somebody that it was like. I just ruined myself in it. And I was like, I don't want to keep losing myself. I'd like, I like who I am now, you know, I don't know. Well, that's a little bit off topic, off topic to fear, because if you're saying you're not afraid of dating, then it doesn't fall in that category. No, anymore. I'm afraid of dating. No, no, we're going back to it. I'm changing my, <laughs> what I said. I'm afraid. Okay. I just wanted you to <laughs> just uh, own up to that. No, no, I, I own. Yeah. Aaron McManus, afraid of dating. And, and, and so we have to realize that if you're afraid of something, there's something that you actually value. And what like, is it that I value? Like you can't be afraid of No, no, anything. no, no. Just what is it that I value then? Like break it down. What you value is the possibility of having someone that you love and that loves you exclusively. That's what I value? That's what you want. No, no. But you said, what do I value? What do I value? That is, that is the value. Oh, Okay. Yeah, it's 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 the ideal. You want something, but you don't know if it's fully possible. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't know. I, it's not that I don't think it is. I don't. I don't think I can achieve it. So I'm good not trying right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think sometimes because of fear, people become self-destructive. You're holding back, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick at you until you stop holding back. No, I I, I think that that fear can make a person self-destructive. If, um, so do you feel like I'm self-destructive? You are. You you move in, you move into relationships that you know can't go somewhere. But is it because yeah? Th but I know that because I also like one thing that I am very similar with you in this way to some regard. Like strength finders, I have like high future orientation. Mm -hmm. Like I can almost see a path in its lifespan 
the moment I meet someone or the moment I get a feeling and get enough data and information. Yeah, but, but both but to, intuitive but and me, logical. It's like driving 100 miles an hour down a street that you already saw the sign that says dead end, and yes. then and then get jumping out of the car when you see a road that actually is going somewhere. It's crazy, isn't it? It's the yeah. best. That's the best metaphor I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that's a metaphor, right? Not an analogy. Sometimes I get those mixed up, <laughs> and and it frustrates me because I go, "Don't you see that this road actually goes somewhere?" Yeah, but you're afraid to get in the car. What is that? Fear. <laughs> fear. Fear is the mind killer. We're back to fear. Finally. So here we go. I want, can I talk? Uh, can I, I hope that wasn't too cumbersome for you. Or no, for but to me, it's like uh, if for everyone who's out there, uh, you need to do some self-valuation because it's our greatest enemy to our own personal happiness and fulfillment is ourselves. Interesting. And That's a clip right there. Since we've been talking about <laughs> your relationships, <laughs> no, I, specifically, I'm talking about no, my fear. Yeah, your fear. No, I, fear of intimacy. But it's it's the same way we look at different things. Like um, there are people who are actually afraid of success, right? And so every time they're about to succeed, they self destruct and make sure they fail. Hmm. There are people who are actually afraid of responsibility. So every time they are given an opportunity to take on more responsibility, they actually walk away from it. It's interesting. And there are people who are afraid of intimacy. Yeah. And so they move into relationships where, um, where um, attraction is the smoke because there is no real possibility of intimacy in that relationship. Hmm. And then when there's a real chance for intimacy, you look for every reason to say, no, that's not right. And it's really just you hiding behind excuses, but you're really hiding from your fears. Okay, I'm going to hit next because I'm done being the subject. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a quote in a book that I like. Can we talk about it or are Absolutely. we done with fear? No, no, fear? no. This is so good. Okay. So I've been reading this book called Dune. Mm -hmm. You, I think I bought it in an airport with you yeah. and I couldn't get into it. So I was like, it's been sitting in your library. I was at your house. I saw the cover. And since buying it, the movie's coming out about it. Yeah, and this is something I've been familiar with since I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, yeah. Frank Herbert, you're yeah. like an author. You always recommended, and and so I, yeah, like I grew up with sci-fi in that genre, mm -hmm. the eighties, like eighties, nineties, seventies, and eighties sci-fi was sure. like something you always passed on. But I got into it a couple of weeks ago, and in in this book. I thought it was really cool because I watched the trailer for the movie and it kind of mm -hmm. gave me images and characters to kind of fill the space with. But uh, there's a scene and there's a uh, long story short, it's a quote on fear. Essentially, his mother has raised him in a way to be like highly intuitive mm -hmm. and highly spiritual and kind of connect with with like the 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 realm that isn't seen, essentially. Mm. And so he talks about this, like he has this little quote thing. Um, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn to see its path. Where the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. And I thought it was really interesting. Because I'm like, just the first thing I must not fear because fear is the mind killer. And I feel like so many times in my life, like, you know this, like when I'm annoying, I pretend like I'm a logical person, but I'm a deeply emotional mm -hmm. and, and, and impulsive <laughs> person that, that tries to be elitist and saying I'm, a, I'm logical, but really I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so, but I do feel like so often I let fear kill any of the creative space in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I'm in a place that is really gets to become dark and destructive and self-destructive. And I can't get out because I've let like fear, you know, put me in chains. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I've like fortified my own like protection with fear. And you, it's so hard to break through that. Like how, how does one not let fear become the mind killer? First of all, it's the, it's the go fear is the mind killer. Yes. And, but it's also fear is the heart killer. Fear is the soul killer. Fear is the love killer. Mm. Fear will destroy your life if you let it um, take hold of you. Right. And um, in, in the book Uprising that I wrote over 20 years ago, I wrote that whatever you fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom. 
And so if you're afraid of heights, you stay low. If you're afraid of the outdoors, you stay inside. If you're afraid of people, you stay alone. If you're afraid of the dark, you stay in the light. Fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom. And so if you are feeling suffocated and if you're fighting for your freedom, you need to realize that you will not step into your freedom until you step through your fears. Hmm. And so not only is fear a mind killer, it kills everything about life. Hmm. But, but one of the reasons it does become a mind killer is because when you're afraid, you cannot see what's right in front of you. And that's the same you know, thing in terms of like opportunity. Um, you might have a career opportunity in front of you, but you're afraid so you can't see it. You might have a person you could spend your life with, but you're afraid so you can't see it. You might have, um, you, you might have a possibility that you've been dreaming of all your life, but because you're afraid you can't see it. Yeah. And this is the thing. People who are afraid see the world smaller. And people who are, are free of that freedom actually see the universe much bigger, see opportunity everywhere, see possibility all around them. And, uh, and, and that's why, you, for me, I, I mean, I was fearful when I was young. And I realized that fear held me captive. Are you afraid of anything now? Um, I am afraid of dying without having lived out everything I was, I was capable of living. And so, and I guess in that sense is that if you're going to be afraid, be afraid of the right things. Yeah. Be afraid yeah. of living too small of a life. Yeah. Be afraid of not living big enough. Be afraid of not loving deeply yeah. enough. I love when like, people you ask know. you like what's on your bucket list. I'm like, this guy doesn't have a bucket list. This guy has like a, <laughs> like a wave pool. <laughs> and he, just down, he wants to do everything. He wants to, tra- he wants to experience everything in life. Yeah. And I, and I think because I realized how many things I missed out on because I was afraid. Yeah. And I just don't want to to look back and go oh i was afraid and, and and so i never did that yeah yeah you know and um you, you know and so it's hard because when you say to a person fear is a mind killer if you're afraid it's already killed your mind mm. you have to have a resurrection mm. and i do think that's where jesus is so liberating that when you put your trust in jesus he begins to break you free from the fears that hold you. Wow. And um, I've always wondered why the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Wow. And because I thought, wait a minute, it, why do we want to fear God? And I realized that, wait a minute, whatever you fear has mastery of your life. And so you, whatever you're afraid of, that's your master. Hmm. And so if you only fear God, then only God is your master. Every other fear will use that fear to hold you captive. Wow. But when you fear God, he destroys the fear because it says that perfect love casts out all fear. Wow. So when you when all your fear is directed toward God, his perfect love casts out all the fear. And now you can live a life that's truly free. Can you please cut that for a clip? Yeah. You keep the clip conversations just in because if you're listening, just hit like the rewind 30 seconds twice and you'll hear it like another time. It's so good. Thank you so much. So, Aaron, what are the first steps you're going to take to be able to overcome your fears? Huh? <laughs> And thank you for listening to the Bad Ready Podcast. <laughs> My name is Aaron McManus. It's been 54 minutes and 13 seconds. And we'll talk about this in episode two. Because you're going to still be in the same place tomorrow if you don't take a first step yeah. into that fear yeah. to walk through it. Yeah. I have a lot to think about after this episode. All right. Well, we'll a lot go, of people. We'll come back for fear part two. A lot of people are wearing masks even after the science says it's not helpful because they're afraid. Hmm. But the mask will not protect them from fear. Hmm. A lot of people are wearing masks you cannot see Hmm. because they're afraid. Hmm. It's time to take off the mask, breathe deeply of life, and stop living in fear. And that's it, guys. That's it. That's the end. That's the thank you so much for listening to the Battle Ready Podcast. My name is Aaron McManus, and I'm here with my dad, Erwin Raphael McManus. And I think this might be one of my favorite episodes we've ever had. Mm. It's been good to be together. It's been so good to be together. And I would love for people to send comments, um, thoughts. Uh, this would be a conversation worth having a follow up. Yeah, I think so too. And maybe we can open it up to for people to talk about their fears and things like that. It'd be really exciting. We talked a lot about projects we're working on. Mm -hmm. we were working on if you missed it or you skipped it 
This is the last thing. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for supporting the podcast on Anchor. And we have people who kind of subscribe and 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 donate a uh, dollar, four dollars. I think it's dollar, five dollars, and ten dollars. And we're so grateful. People give each and every month. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Um, also, every person who is listening, please rate and review this podcast. We have like almost eight hundred ratings. I think. And we have a pretty high rating. It's like 4.8 or something. That's amazing. That's way better than my GPA in college. So (laughs) go and rate and review this podcast. Thank you so much. Share this with a friend, someone who's struggling with fear. And go to the Genius of Podcast right now on Apple Podcasts. Rate and review it. And go. It's also on Spotify. It will be on YouTube. It's not there yet. It'll be on Earl McManus's YouTube page. And last but not least, the most important thing, dear to our hearts, go to The Genius of Jesus on Amazon and pre-order the book. Maybe you've never pre-ordered a book in your entire life. This would mean so much to us. It helps the publisher know, it helps Amazon know to prioritize this book and get this message out. Jesus was a genius. And maybe you don't agree with it. Then buy the book and figure out if you do. (laughs) We'll talk about it. We'll have space when The Genius of comes out to really break it down on this podcast because you're going to be focused on genius Mm -hmm. on your podcast. We'll be focusing on how to get there. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Love you guys. Thank you so much for everything that you do and and being a part of this Batteretti community and tribe. We love you guys. We will see you next Friday. 